2 a.m. Okay. So please go ahead and put your full name and location or country into the chat. Thank you. Wow. Okay. It is two o'clock Eastern time. So I'm going to start. So welcome everyone that is here. Um, this is uh, the last session of the Best of the Electronic Village Online, or EVO, from our 2022 sessions. EVO is part of TESOL through the call interest section, where it was founded in the year 2000, and we had our first sessions in 2001. I'm one of the co-founders of EVO, Christine Bauer Ramazani and also a facilitator uh, as one of the EVO coordinators. And I'm here co-facilitating with Nelly and Nagla and um, Sanya. So we want to give you a hearty welcome uh, to Best of EVO and Nagla is going to introduce the sessions. Thank you, Christine. So today we have two sessions, uh, designing materials for business English teachers and trainers. And the second is delivering best practice, uh, best practices for distance and blended courses. And now uh, it gives me great, great pleasure to welcome uh, the first session. So um, I'll ask the presenters for designing materials mm -hmm. for business English teachers and trainers. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, one, one more note. Uh, the session should be about 15 minutes long, followed by five minutes of questions and answers. If you have comments, please post them in the chat. If you have questions, please post them in the chat. We'll be monitoring the chat and ask the questions at the end, but you also will have a chance to uh, pose your question with a mic and with a video. So go ahead, uh, sorry for interrupting. Well, thank you very much for inviting us along to share our ideas. We got together in a group and decided that with the pandemic and all the problems going on, that this was actually something that would be very useful for business teachers to know. And if you have a look at our moderators on the, the left, you'll see that some of our moderators came from Mexico and Argentina, and the others were based in Germany, Italy, Ukraine, and me in my little island very close to <laughs> France. But it meant that we were able to have moderators working at different times. So that was a, a really useful thing. Yeah. And please note it says Channel Islands and not UK. So we insist, don't we? So, okay, <laughs> good. So basically what we decided on was actually, why did we do that? Um, so Ray mentioned um, a lot of our teachers, like teachers everywhere around the world had to go online and had to teach from like distant um, locations. And then we thought about, so what actually makes it special? What do we need to pay attention to if our teaching environment changes that drastically. And I think the biggest thing that we identified were um, two things that was on the one hand visual impact, because you just have really like a different idea of visual understanding online. And then it was also that teachers just need to learn to recycle materials better. So that's what we did. So we thought about new learner needs. So we thought about like special educational needs and something like this. We thought about the need to adapt to this different teacher environment and to the learners needs likewise. So we thought about, okay, what can be relevant materials and what can be online materials and how can we help our teachers to save time when preparing? And that's basically where we then had a call for submissions. And I think people came up with really great ideas. So, um, so you want to talk about that? Yeah, or you so want me to? What we decided yeah. to do was make each week stand alone, but with a, 
a developmental theme that ran through everything. So we started with looking at materials themselves and the different kinds of materials that were already on offer. And we looked at if you wanted to design materials, how you would go about it and what, what the best practice ideas were. By the time we got to week two, we were looking at copyright, we were looking at plagiarism, we were looking at creative commons and, and how you can't just help yourself to whatever is out there online. You actually have to think about what you're using, what you're stealing from other people. But those guidelines then moved into week two when we started to look at special educational needs. And in our second part, we were looking at infographics. By week four, we were recycling materials, always thinking about copyright, thinking about how to make them visually appealing. And week five, we decided to build games out of the material that our students were offering us. So rather than just producing games of our own, we were looking at how business games could come from the students themselves. Yeah. And we finished with a nice show and tell. So I think the, the key thing was basically that we gave the tools, but the participants had to design. So the workload was, I think some people realized that they didn't really have enough time to finish the course. So we had a huge number of registrations, but then people realized that at some point you really have to stop. Because um, I think a lot of designing is very material or like time intensive, but that was also the idea. So, um, for example, when we started on week three and people said, OK, so I want to use infographics then, and ready made infographics. And I have to check what is actually allowed to do with the infographics that we found. And that sort of like feeds back on what we did about creative commons and licenses and everything. And how can you turn maybe infographics or visual elements all into something that works with gamification or that helps you to recycle. One infographic that works with this course can maybe work with other courses. And that by, that's basically what you can also see here in the more detailed syllabus. So we won't spend too much time on this. You can read this if you want to download the slides. You can have a closer look. Um, I think the key thing was that in week three and four, we had these two um, shared weeks because we thought that like visual design and then tweaking materials, which was week four, um, worked quite well when you looked at like special needs, but also at, for example, speaking and writing materials. And that's basically what we decided on. Okay, so then over to week one, Sue. Well, week one, we didn't set up a registration week. So we actually used week one as part of a registration, but that allowed us to check on who the people were who were taking part and also on um, al allowing the moderators time to get to know the people at the same time as they were getting to know each other. We started with loads of participants. We finished with quite a few as well, but we, we certainly had more at the start than we expected. Um, Evan Friendo started us off with um, a bit of video, which he had actually prepared three years ago. And then he offered extra assistance through his website for people who picked up on some of the ideas they'd never heard of before. And um, the tasks were great. We had a telephone task at the end of the week and there was some really, really interesting material created. And in fact, all the way through, I think the material was fantastic, but um, it, it, it worked really well. And the feedback was positive. As the materials were shared, the interaction set the scene for the rest of the session because people just got involved, shared ideas, uh, talked about the ideas that other people were sharing. It, it was a great week. I really enjoyed week one. Yeah, um, I think we should add also that in the beginning, when we asked people where they come from, why they're at the courts, we also said, what are your favorite materials? And I think this is basically where we kicked off this kind of avalanche of links and ideas. And you should try this and you should try that. And as we had a very huge mix of participants, we had some very experienced 
business English trainers that have been designing their own materials for years. But we also had a lot of rookies, so people who just moved from general English into business English or who were just thinking about taking a career there or starting their career. Um, like teaching business English at a uni or in some companies, I think a lot of people just benefited from this wealth of materials and links that were already shared in week one. So we also decided, of course, to um, compile a slide with those links. If you're interested in that, I think you have to drop me a line and I'll send you the slides as well. But I put my email into the chat so you can do that too. And I think that's also um, what we had then with week two. So week two, as I said, focused on um, licenses and copyrights. And I think that's a huge issue because we all know it's just so easy to click on something and just use it in the classroom and nobody knows about it. And our moderators were very, very strict. And they tried again and again to really explain what the difficulties are, what the problems can be, and what the different Creative Commons abbreviations mean in everything. And that's basically their feedback. So I think some content was already familiar, but participants really had to share an online source that they were allowed to share and say what they were allowed to do with it. So really go through the whole process. And um, so I think that what we really enjoyed was basically um, working in this team of collaborators. So you have a partner on the same wavelength and then it's actually something that really helps you to stay focused. I think the support of the presenters and moderators was great. And in the future, I think for nearly every week, it goes that we should have this less is more because a lot of people found it really difficult to cope with this because it's such a challenging topic. But um, it was also actually something that in all weeks, especially week two, we asked students to leave their comfort zones and people really shared their insights. So how do you do this with a YouTube video? What are you allowed to do with this tool and with that tool? And I think that was also very nice. And then um, I think the moderators learned a lot from the participants. That's my key takeaway anyway. So that's a way to give something back to this teaching community. And um, I think that's something that worked extremely well with people supporting each other saying, okay, if you're in this country, you have to pay attention to this. And if you work on that, or if you, if, if you want to use YouTube, that's the way you filter for Creative Commons videos or something like this. So um, I learned a lot. I think I possibly learned most in that week. So, and that takes us to week three, Sue? Week three was the first of our two-part weeks in in retrospect, it was probably a little bit ambitious. We started with a really interactive live session from Martin Bloomfeld, and he was looking at teaching dyslexic students. But we built in an idea of how we would work with other teacher, other students who had um, Bloomfield, sorry, <laughs> Bloomfeld. <laughs> That's <laughs> Catherine Lichterfeld. <laughs> um, and we were we were looking at um, special educational needs. So that, that first week meant that everybody came away with strategies that they could use, um, different fonts they could use, and ways to actually create materials that worked for people, even if they didn't know that they had people with special needs in their classrooms. The second part of the week was uh, Grace in Mexico, who looked at infographics, but she wanted to make sure that students could create infographics, not just teachers, and that it wasn't just a case of taking infographics and using other people's material, because thinking back to the, the previous week, some of the Creative Commons rights weren't there. So if you're going to do that, you may as well learn how to make them yourself. And by the time we finished, we had the most amazing pool of really attractive and really innovative lessons, which everybody's got a chance to take away and use. Yeah. OK, and that takes us to week four, which was also a shared week. So I actually started off with um, um, something. I mean, I have to say I'm the laziest teacher in the world. What I'm really, really good at is recycling. I do this here. Oh, I can just use it again. And I think that's basically what, what, what saved me, what, what kept me sane also during COVID when teaching was, was just increasing. So, and I was really 
overwhelmed with this positive response that we got on tweaking materials. We just told people, well, that's the best way to recycle and to make sure that you have the materials organized and ready so that you don't start your lessons from scratch. And I was really quite shocked to see how few people actually do that. So that's maybe just me being an organized German. I have no idea. Um, so there was a great feedback on this. And I think and we discussed framework materials in week one, and that came in very handy. People said, OK, so I built framework and then I just changed some details. And that is how I can actually um, really help myself here. So I think that was really great. And, and we're going to show you some, deta some, some examples later on. And um, people really enjoyed that. And then Rachel Appleby, our colleague in Budapest, did a great job on what do we do with printed materials, so material that's already available in textbooks, but that might not fit our needs exactly. So how we can sort of like lift it from the page, add our own ideas. And that was basically the task that the participants had to do. And she was also very pleased with the detail and with also the way that people interacted with each other. So to people who are new to the EV, EVO world, I think that's maybe something quite unusual. And um, I think it was also very good to see that authenticity, online tools and everything, and the importance of giving feedback was um, catered for as well. So, and that takes us to week five, which was the gamification, the fun part, yay. Sue? Well, it was really a question of taking material that was already in existence, as in um, emails from colleagues and things that, that um, business people were using already, but turning them into games, turning them into gap fills and, and, and finding ways to make games become fun. And, and ways of teaching that used games online in a way that um, really, really made the, the end goals of instruction part of what we were doing. The, the creation was, was great. Yeah. So, and um, so basically our takeaways are this, so that um, even experienced teachers like Sue and me got lots of new ideas. Um, I think we really gave a big boost to new teachers who felt now encouraged to design their own materials and also what apps and tools are available. I think WordWall was just the most used app and you're going to see this why uh, in a minute. Um, it's also like getting a grasp of the legal pitfalls and also, and that was the most, I think week three, especially the first week with Martin, uh, the first part of the week with Martin, so many people said, I just realized how many dyslexic students I have and I never paid attention to it because nobody told me to. So I think that was just one of the biggest takeaways for all of us. And then also the feedback uh, from, from everybody involved. And of course, the big takeaway was teachers should never stop learning. And just to, to catch up with this before we move into the Q&A, so we just provided some examples that are representative of what our learners provided. So this is one of the model lessons for phone calls. Yeah, so um, giving you questions, giving you the language, the vocabulary and everything, and then developing a real lesson plan out of it. Some people really did this, not just one activity. Um, talking about infographics. So this is an infographic that we use to help people understand Creative Commons licenses. And we checked that we were allowed to use it that way. And then one of our students, for example, found this infographics for um, writing business emails. So this is like the starter. And that also appeals, of course, to people who do not like reading that much, who get a key issue with, with text processing or colors and something like this. So we found that also very attractive. And then um, we asked people to create a mind map, what life is like for dyslexic people in the teaching world out there, what it should be like. And a lot of our people used Jamboard or other tools that we provided and um, started then really thinking about the issue far more. And I just did this very organized thing. So I said, actually, I want you to create a checklist of recycling materials. So for every new activity you design, who is it for? What's the description? How can you recycle it? In which groups can you use it? What are the key objectives? And this is just one example where students really started working on this and completing the chart. And then we had something about um, email writing, for example, the scrap formula, when you do uh, think about um, something like 
complaints. Yeah, so, so situation, complication, action, resolution, and politeness. And this resonated very well with all our participants. And I mentioned word wall already. And word wall was just basically um, very, very popular for the game activities as well. So it's two of the activities that our students designed for like a card game or like a quiz where you have to click on the right one. And if you prepare it also in this visual way, then a lot of students with special educational needs also find it easier to relate to the game factor and work like this. So, and then we had some testimonials. Sue, last word to you. Um, I, I sent out 82 uh, certificates and these were just some of the things that came back in the thank yous. So we, we got lots of people who were saying they'd already put the new material into practice um, and, and people, I like the, uh, I hope you all have an amazing spring from the one at the bottom. But the, the session seems to have really hit the mark. It was useful and people have taken it and run with it, which you can't really ask for more. Yeah. I think that that's something we got also from the so we did a kind of like follow up with the needs and everything and that's basically where we are already at the end Christine thanks for the reminder so because we also asked people how much did you achieve your goals and I think a lot of people overachieved so it was a lot of work but people really benefited from it and um, started already implementing stuff and became aware of how they can design things in a more effective and student-centered way so thank you very much and that's that's basically where we move to the Q&A, but um, I have no problem at all to just stop sharing if you want to bring the cameras on. You want me to do that, Christine? Christine, you're maybe mute. We, maybe we can do that in the end. Yeah. yeah. Everyone. Okay, so I'll just leave it there, but we are open for questions and you can also contact us if you, if you want any more information about this. So just put my basic email put my email in there and then um, we're happy to to do that too. But we're also open for Three questions now. Somewhere. Thank well, you, Harley. You have, yes, it, you have one question already, Kirsten. <laughs> Good. And, Sue, <laughs> and the rest of the team. And that is, are you going to be offering this session again next year? We could because we would just recycle <laughs> and maybe actually make sure that everybody just gets like one week or something like this, like slim it down a bit. But yes, if there's an interest, we could just offer it again and to recycle the whole thing. Yes. So, um, uh, Hale, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Yes, it was amazing. Yes. And um well, you apply through the EVO, basically. We usually do it every two years, but I think in, if, we, if we're doing it in two years, we'll possibly go on something very similar because I think these areas need to be explored more. Yeah. There's another question. Uh, what was the acronym SCRAP again? Okay, uh, okay. Um, I think it, I could just go, hold on. I can just go back. Um, so SCRAP is something that one of our participants actually developed um, so where you uh, deal with it like the situation the complication the problem the resolution and then the action so what you want your reader to take to fix the problem and then the politeness so it's the five um, aspects that you need when you deal with an email of complaint uh, so and that's basically what she wants her students to use and I think it became very popular so everybody said oh great I'm gonna nick it I'm gonna steal it so this is why we decided to use this as an example of the um, writing materials okay okay um, there was a comment by Rosemary and I'm mm -hmm. trying to get the whole thing in the chat here um, she happened into uh, ESL, uh, and that was 40 years ago. Um, and she's asking if anybody has advice for her. Uh, Rosemary, I'm wondering if you are located in, in Germany. Um, maybe not, but um, there is her email. If anybody has advice for her, if you could probably, probably would be best if you got in touch with somebody from the team and posed direct questions to them 
Uh, mm -hmm. And then maybe something could be arranged with a, a Zoom session or whatever um, if it can't be dealt with in an email. So that's she's in my the US. Suggestion. Yeah. She's in the US. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any other questions? So, Rosemary, is that a, a good suggestion for your situation and your questions? Uh, please provide the PowerPoint or the yeah. slideshow, rather. Mm -hmm. Yes, we will do that. Okay, so, so yeah, can you link post the link added. to yeah, the please. Google in the chat? I can. Here it mm -hmm. comes. Uh, and uh, there seems to be a question from Anne Lamparis. Mm -hmm. So that's basically, if you click on that link, that takes you to the slides. And I put in my email again. So um, feel also free to contact us via email. And if I can't answer the question, I can also redirect it. If it's business English related, I can also redirect it or post it in, in our forum. So that's our problem. Mm -hmm. Okay. And there's a comment by Arlen Fried that the EV 2021 materials are also online. Um, Yes, the recordings of the EV sessions as well as the EVO sessions, uh, excuse me, have been streamed for uh, several years and you can find them online, indeed. Okay, so, and um, by the way, that's a good thing, Christine. Uh, Anne Lamparis has finished her questions. So yes. how did you get the business English content? Did you do a needs assessment per industry sector and specific job performance? Oh, um, Sue, how do we answer that one? We, um, we did ask in the first week what the industry specifics were, yeah. but we did, we, we allowed everybody to tailor the materials to their own industry. So, so yes, we, we, we did work on that. I should say that basically all the presenters have already a, a track record of working like 20 years in the uh, business English industry. So we also discussed, so what do every, what does everybody need to do? And um, I think you all know that everybody still needs to write emails or everybody needs to manage phone or let's say Zoom calls or something like this. So we focused rather on the functions and then the special things, and then people adapted this. So for example, week one, when they did the telephone calls, so some people were taught in customer service and other people taught HR people. And then one, one lady said, I just started with one HR student. I have no idea about HR. And then everybody said, okay, what does your HR student need to do? She needs to talk to colleagues on the phone. Maybe she has to fire someone or she has to organize a meeting on the phone create the phone call for that. So I think that was also something that we did. Um, yes, and I understand. So it's not English as ESP. So it's not about accounting or working in the car industry or the automotive industry. Business English focuses rather on the big six, meetings, emails, um, phone calls, video calls these days. Um, what else do we have? The big six presentations. Um, I forgot the other two or something like this, uh, because these are the situations that all of the business people have to master, no matter which industry are in. And then, for example, with the infographics, people chose those infographics that are relevant to the industry that they are working in. If you go to something like visualcapitalist.com, it's amazing. You find infographics for every part of business. Yeah. So, and I think that that was a very good mix. And then people just learn from each other because they discovered what's available out there. Yeah. Does that help? Ah, okay. I try. Um, <laughs> if I remember that, so you have to help me here. So it's emailing. It's correspondence rather. Presentations. Things, telephone. Meetings. Yeah, I can't. Um, meetings. Telephoning. That's four. What are the other two? Um, oh, presentations. Yeah, presentations I have done. Dealing with visitors, basically. And um, so correspondence, presentations, meetings, phone calls, visitors. And I think also like business travel or something like this. What so, about restaurants, um, eating out? Yeah, so that would be like business travel. Clients. Yeah. Um, 
So visitors would also be something like, of course, meetings, but also small talk, company tours and everything. And then you also have like business travel. So maybe it's not all the big six, but um, and a lot of that covers intercultural issues as well. But I think so basically we deal with the difficult with the different situations and not so much with the specific industries. Yeah. Mm -hmm. OK. And I have a question uh, and maybe we can wrap it up after that. Uh, did you deal with ESP in an academic context at all? Probably uh, not so much. Yep. To a certain extent, yes, because quite a few of our teachers work in an academic context right. and they have to teach like business English there yeah. to the academic yes. students. So less the ESP, but definitely academic context, because we have a lot of people who study like um, okay. business or business management. And of course, they need English. Mm -hmm. um, but people also brought in ESP topics. So um, like like um, especially with the infographics. Uh, yes, so I think Aline just put in like visual ca capitalist. So basically, if you Google visual capitalist, you get to that website. And um, I think if you drop me a line, then I'm happy to share also some of the link lists that we created. I copied every link from every post, hours wow. of hours of work. But it was worth yeah. it because now I have all the materials. Mm -hmm. Okay. I was going to say uh, I taught... E uh, not just business English, but business for 15 years and also had my students uh, who were studying business but needed English. So I did mm. both and I have a rather extensive web website with some of those materials as well. Yeah. So, so basically, great. Basically, it's the workforce task. Good. I think that's it from us. All right. Okay. Thank you so much. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so. And I stop sharing yes, and please. give it over okay. to the next presenter. All right. So our next session is delivering best practices for distance and blended courses. So uh, let's get started. Christine. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And uh, we want to thank the Colias and uh, of TESOL for including our session here and all the other um, EVO sessions. Um, our session on delivering best practices in distance and uh, blended courses was designed and taught by six teachers and teacher trainers and instructional designers. I was the lead moderator of the session um, and I'm located in Vermont in the USA, but originally from Germany. Uh, and I thoroughly enjoyed working with my very global team, uh, that's Sue Annan, uh, who just spoke, who's located in Jersey, the island, mind you, uh, Rose Bard in Brazil, uh, Larissa Olisova in Washington, D.C., Christine Savier in Lebanon, and Jack Watson in New Brunswick, Canada. Our session was hosted on the platform Canvas Free for Teachers. And next, Sue will tell us about the overall plan for the session. Our plan was to model best practices for teachers and particularly for teachers who needed to set up robust online lessons, which is particularly important at this time. We also wanted them to do their own Canvas account, but we only asked them to present one lesson which incorporated the best practice ideas, including interactive and collaborative tasks. And at all times, we, the moderators, modelled best practice. And we expected the same from our participants, who came from many different countries. And um, I'll ask Larissa to tell us about those. Okay, next slide. So the next slide uh, with a chart, uh, it represents It is not advancing. Okay. Oh. Mm. There we go. Okay. There you go. This chart represents the participants who joined our session from five continents. And you see the highest numbers of participants joined from Europe and followed by participants from South America. So next slide. And here's the map that shows our participants and moderators' locations. And you see that the participants and moderators joined from all the places in the world. 
uh, with the majority of them, again, located in Europe. Next slide. This is Sue. Yeah, I've kind of lost the top of it. Um, as we as we realised that the, the five weeks were really full, we decided we would add a registration week and that allowed everybody time to get to know each other. The first week was an orientation around Canvas itself and lots of reading about best practice. Second week allowed the participants to start building their own sites and to add their lesson plan. And then the following two weeks were specialising one week on interaction and the interactive tools that exist. And the second week, the, the, the week after that was on collaboration and collaborative tools. We then got them to finish off their Canvas site with the relevant assignments page. And then they had a show and tell, which was fun. Some of the show and tell was done live and some of it was done on Flipgrid. And uh, Christine Sabier can now let us know what actually informed our course. Well, what we did in the next segment, slide please. We're working on it. <laughs> No, it uh, will not. Well, end. meanwhile, just let me just go ahead and then we can skip to the one after it. Yeah. So, in the next segment, what we're going to discuss is the theories and research that basically created our course design on best practices in distance and blended courses. So, as you can see, we went from theory to practice. And what we did was we combined the behaviorist and constructionist approach to learning when planning and teaching how to deliver the best practices. Given that the duration of the course was a total of five weeks, too short of a period for the participants basically to explore and self grow on their own through trial and error, what we decided to do as moderators was a model best practices as a way to mentor them through scaffolding as well as involving them as much as possible through social learning approaches. So what happened was as they grew individually within the groups of participants, they were engaging with theory and practice, they were interacting with their peers and tutors, and they were collaborating and at the same time reflecting with each other and they were planning their own mapping of best practices to deliver the teaching with technology support using their students at home as their expected tutors in their own teaching learning environments. So what happened was they planned uh, with their students in mind, thinking how would their students learn most effectively by applying the best practices that they were learning in the course. Together as a group, we all grew. Together as a group, um, each participant grew to meet the learning outcomes we set for the course. And the course was full of tasks and project-based learning opportunities. So they read material, they discussed, they reflected, they shared each gave feedback to the other. They created their own plans to show their applications of best practices. And weekly they acquired the strategies and explored the tech tools that we recommended for them to plan with. And they felt that they would be able to work within their teaching learning environments. We all worked together, mentoring and collaborating to ensure that they were engaged. The outcome was rich to reflect the purpose of our five weeks of coursework. In the next slide, Christine bauer Ramsanzani, sorry, will explain the approach we worked with to integrate the technology in the teaching and learning setting. Thank you, Christine. Now, some of you may have seen this before. This is the TPAC model, which we used um, as our approach. It was uh, created by Mishra and Curler in 
2006 and then refined in 2009. Um, it shows the fundament, a fundamental model of how to integrate technology into teaching. Uh, and it consists of the technological knowledge, the uh, pedagogical knowledge and the content knowledge and uh, the content knowledge and pedagogical knowledge need to be applied. And when all of them intersect with the technology, that's when we get the sweet spot, what is called the sweet spot, um, which optimizes the integration of technology uh, into teaching and learning. So with that in mind, with that model in mind, we asked our participants to construct their lessons and I will show you next more about that. So as was already mentioned, uh, our main uh, page on in each week, there were several pages, but the main page was the task and assignments page. And this is a screenshot from a Canvas uh, course page in week one. Um, it shows the, an end due date. Uh, it shows the topic of the week or topics. Uh, it shows the goals and the expected learning outcomes for the week as they relate to the topics of the week. Uh, and then there are the associated tasks to be carried out, as well as the assignments that need to be completed during the week. So for example, one of the tasks in week one, uh, and I'm not, sure, I'm not sure why that's not showing up. This is a, um, there's something that, oh no. Um, okay. So one of the tasks in week one for the, was for the participants to choose one article per week. They could have done more, but one was a requirement uh, and use it from a category of resources uh, in readings, depending on their teaching environment. So there were lots of different categories to choose from. Uh, and also it was related to the topic of the week they needed to discuss the article and its application to teaching and learning in a discussion group, uh, in a reading discussion forum. Another task uh, in week one was to show their previous or discuss their previous experience with distance and uh, blended teaching in their own teaching environment and discuss that in the sharing discussion forum. And next, Christine will show how the session project um, applied the theory and practice. So keeping in mind content learn, no, keeping in mind content learning as the outcome for the practice, we relied on Bloom's taxonomy to plan the participants journey. So weekly we would create assignments and tasks and we base them in a way that they would be able to digest the knowledge of theory through application. They assimilated the breakdown of their comprehension through analysis, brainstorming, and they provided a synthesis of main points supported by real life examples. And they did this weekly. Just like their discussion points were reflected and commented on by their peers, they too did this um, throughout the coursework. The theory included content as well as technology recommendations to enable them to explore and create engaging digital learning teaching environments of best practice delivery for content acquisition. And the whole time they were doing this, they were thinking about who would they be working with. So as this table shows, we planned the tasks so that each thing that they did was related to a theory. So week by week, they would work on their project, which was the creation of the Canvas module with one lesson to reflect delivery of best practices. So for example, the yellow column highlighted the examples of tasks and assignments based on the weeks. The green column showed the action that the participants have to do. The red column, showed the expected practice to be able to reflect their understanding of theory. And they were engaged in this manner across four weeks. So throughout the week, 
the individuals were growing, reflecting, engaging, interacting, and collaborating. So for example, if you look at, the, at, if you look at one of the um, assignments, they were asked to read to acquire knowledge. So this is an example of Bloom. And on another um, uh, task, they were asked to look at models of modalities of content delivery by clicking on certain links. So they would look at them and what would they see? They would see examples using behaviorism and TPAC. At the same time, they were asked to share on discussion forums to engage their ideas and share and evaluate. Again, this was an example of how they were using social learning theory and constructivism. Their final project, which was the accumulation of all the weeks of work, which was the Canvas module with one lesson reflecting the whole course of learning. They uploaded it on their own Canvas site that they created. They had to present it and they had, to e they had it evaluated by their peers. And this was an example of integrating all the learning theories plus Bloom and Papa. So Sue Annan will now reflect on a few um, uh, feedbacks that we were able to, uh, to view. Well, we started by thinking we'd be working with teachers who were comfortable with technology. But in fact, we found that a lot of them were actually less able than we'd expected. And this meant that it created a steep learning curve and there were challenges with time management and lots of work for the moderators. Once we got into the um, weeks where we were able to use rubrics, they were a really excellent help. They, um, I, I guess we should use them really from the beginning next time and that will weed out the the people who can't manage but uh, the end showed that we had eight participants who completed the course to everyone's satisfaction and as i said before the presentations were either live or on flipgrid um it it worked <laughs> It worked, but there were things that might be a good idea to go back and, and reflect on and do differently next time. Um, Rose will now show our outcomes. Rose, you are on mute. I totally forgot to unmute myself. I'm sorry about that. Okay, so um, I saw a saying that were eight participants co who conclude this session successfully. It was really a pleasure to see how they put things together at the end, uh, a learning for all of us as well to see the progress. Uh, but there were also other participants who actively engaged in the forum discussion, submit their lessons uh, for feedback, and also try to accomplishing the tasks. And as an outcome, they created the Canvas site for the learners, designed a lesson that included a variety of tools. I said, we have already talked about it before, right? And we had about 57 lessons submitted for assessment and reassessment. And those who conclude the session assignments by week four, we're also able to put together a presentation to explain the best practice, ideas, and the rationale behind each part of the uh, week five. And next is uh, Jack is going to show us some of the feedback we have received. Thank you. Thanks, Rose. Uh, the DBP moderating team invited course feedback and received unsolicited commentary as well. So here's some uh, an example of topics and reactions. Um, comments from participants new to online teaching. The most challenging part was to put immediately into practice everything I learned, given that I have almost no experience in online teaching. 
As it turns out, uh, inexperience was no deterrent. Uh, I have certainly learned a lot and have created my own Canvas platform. Thank you so much. Uh, success comes from community support, says one participant. I think that the course succeeded in creating a comforting environment in a very friendly community. Um, and support and common experience help participants to meet the challenge as well. Uh, it's a challenging but pleasant experience. The sharing and responses are inspiring. Uh, time limits are always a good motivator. Uh, special thanks for that ex extra mile that made me implement what I have learned so far. Under different circumstances, I would delay it for months. Um, now, quite a bit of the DBP challenge revolved around selecting, understanding, and reacting to the variety of reading materials uh, this participant offers. The reading selections were very interesting, and as a result, it took quite a long time to go through all of them, form an opinion, and express it. Um, so, uh, uh, for future iterations of DBP, uh, uh, those will reflect our feedback. Here's an example. For the future DBP, I will strongly suggest keeping sharing form and the module lesson design. And one participant sums it up this way. It was everything an EVO session should be content, connection, content, and network. So thanks to all the participants. And now I'm uh, here to walk us through the final uh, finalist presentation titles is Rose. Over to you, Rose. Thank you, Zach. Yes. So we have we have just here on these slides, you know, uh, the overview of the eight final modules, which you can actually access uh, through the join code in Flipgrid, right? Um, as we had mentioned before, there were um, synchronous uh, presentations done by two participants, uh, Michelle and Mike, and the other participants, they, they record the videos and would love you to go there. So take note of the access our presentation and um, join us there and take a look at what they have produced. Next slide with Larissa, please. Hey, thanks, Rose. And we prepared this 50 second uh, video. Please enjoy uh, all eight uh, finals presentations. Thank you so much, Larissa. Uh, Larissa called this uh, the chuk chuk. So, <laughs> and it was. So, thank you very much. We were definitely all amazed at these final projects um, that illustrated uh, what we had modeled. And uh, so, for future plans, we're basing um, our future plans on two major sources. What our uh, participants had said in their comments, in the discussion forums, and also in their projects uh, and on the projects, the comments that we wrote on their projects. So we will make some refinements. And we also sent out a Google form and that's where some of the comments were, uh, came from as well as uh, feedback for a, future, uh, for a future course. So um, we decided uh, that the DBP session was a success based on what the um, participants had said, and we plan to offer it again next year. Um, what they loved the most was the hands-on nature of the tasks and assignments. So we will continue to model and to stress those. Thirdly, our participants found the, that quality matters 
and quality matter standards and rubrics, uh, which were referred to in, in week one, again, in week five, but we will put them uh, in the entire uh, sequence of weeks. And the link is at the end. So you will see that in a minute. Uh, we also used rubrics in weeks one, um, uh, in weeks four and three and two, three and four, but we will add them more for weeks one uh, and more in week two, as well as checklists. So next are our sources. And our sources include that link to uh, Quality Matters under the course readings. So if you're interested in that link, uh, you can go to it there. We will uh, post the link to the session uh, slideshow in just a minute. So um, next is just our team picture with email addresses. If you'd like to email us, go right ahead. And we're open for questions now. Thank you so much, DBP team. Great work. Christine, can you stop this? Or Jack, can you stop the screen sharing? Certainly. Yeah, maybe Thank we can you. have people have their cameras on. Yes. Is that possible? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That's the idea. Any questions? So now you can voice your questions. I have a question about grades. I don't know if you mentioned it. Um, how did the grade, Great. did you have a great, yes, a grading system, like, you know, finish, complete. Um, uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, we, we didn't use grades, but the Canvas grade book allows you to post uh, complete or incomplete. And, you know, so if something was incomplete, that's where we got the 57 uh, reiterations of lessons. Uh, so several of them uh, were refined several times um, because they were marked incomplete according to the rubric that we had used. And the rubric, by the way, was just uh, the goals of the week that we had posted and whether they were implemented or not. And that's where a lot of them decided uh, they didn't have enough time to work on or they felt too challenged to give the time to make the refinement and modifications needed. So basically it was not just um, the Canvas course, but the Canvas course that they created uh, back in week one, uh, it then had to show tasks and assignments and implement the interaction and collaborative feature features that we discussed and modeled. So that was, uh, it was definitely challenging and time consuming, um, but worthwhile. Okay, no questions. Mm -hmm. Did we overwhelm everyone here? No, no. <laughs> Lots of positive comments in the chat. So everyone was Yeah, uh, yeah I have not inspired. been watching the chat. Uh, <laughs> yeah, just, we just, um, just comments and about the fact that Canvas is actually free, which yeah. I think is absolutely amazing. Yeah. That mm -hmm. um, there's so many features for free on Canvas. You don't have to pay anything. And some people mentioned that they got confused with Canvas and Canva. But actually, it's Canvas in structure. So it, they do have yeah, that name. If, if you to just go to Canvas, uh, you're not going to find it. You have to go to Canvas Free for teachers. Um, and I'm going to go and look for it right now. I added it. Oh, you did. OK, thank you, Nelly. Yeah, I added um, the link. Well, what about you guys? As um, facilitators with experience in actually teaching your own online courses, uh, what were some of the highlights, the aha moments that you had about each other? Um, okay. 
I'll let somebody Thank else you. answer that. <laughs> Sure, I'll, 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 I'll start. I'm kind of the junior partner in this whole thing. And uh, <laughs> there by invitation after, after probably the fourth meeting of the, of the rest of the team. And uh, uh, my reflection is that I probably learned more than I gave uh, throughout the meetings beforehand and during the, during the session. Uh, there um, uh, the tremendous experience. I would do this all over again in our RFP. Because Thank you're you quite a, it's a yeah. big group. You know, you're how many? How many did you have on? We were six. Uh, the team? Two, two, two. Six. 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 Yeah. I I found the time zones was the, <laughs> the hard <laughs> bit in the beginning. <laughs> just trying to get us all to coordinate. But Christine did a fantastic job of mm -hmm. planning, programming, organizing everything. So we, I, I think we worked really well as a team. Yes. Yeah, I have to agree. And, uh, you know, as someone who uh, retired uh, more recently and maybe sooner than I, I had expected, my entire program, my entire department was eliminated. So within one month, everything and everybody was gone. Um, this allowed me to carry on what I love the most. And the other thing I should say is, um, you know, I watched uh, teach and I talked a little bit at the beginning of the pandemic and I watched had been watching for at least 10 years of what colleagues were doing and uh, it was a mishmash of things and definitely not best practices so um, having designed and uh, taught online courses according to best practices and uh, authored articles on this, I felt that it was, there was a great need for it, especially during the pandemic. So uh, that pre presented the impetus for the whole thing. And then my team, um, I have met online over time uh, and in person at PSOC conferences, have worked with them for several years. So it was, um, I don't know, um, synergies, I guess, really good synergies. Mm -hmm. That's great. All right. All right. Time for a group picture, maybe? Yes. Oh, yes. Has everybody opened their, I think I gave everybody rights, right? If Arlene is here, then yes. Everybody has the right to unmute themselves if they want to shout out or sing a song and um, <laughs> open your cameras. I just want to say thank you for the presentation. It's, it has been very challenging to switch to completely online instruction as opposed to, you know, mixture or whatever. And the new tools that are coming out, is, it's a, you know, rapid. You know? And then the other ones <clears throat> become defunct. And um, certainly I've been following Christine for years and, you know, learned from her textbook. So um, it is, she can definitely attest to everything that we've learned has you know, gone away and come back in different forms. Uh, so this has been, I really want to take this class is what I'm saying. So thank you. Thank you, Arlen, for the comment. We'll see you next year then. <laughs> Hi, Elena and everybody else who's joined. Okay, is this everybody? So who's our um, cameraman? Okay, I'll take Agla, it. were you going to yeah, do it? Yeah, I'll do that. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so we're saying monkey, right? That's the thing that uh, Cheryl taught us. For the old cheese. Cheese. Instead of cheese, monkey, right? Monkey. So we can be a bit ludic. Okay. <laughs> oh, let, no. me, let me check how it turned out. And let's see. Yeah, looks good. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank so, you, everyone. Thank and, you. Uh, thank you on behalf of uh, EBO and TESOL and the Call IS for being here. Thank we you enjoyed guys. your participation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.